Well, welcome to you all, and thank you for introducing me. Uh, I think there are three particular contexts that I'd like to um, say are relevant to giving this lecture today. And the first, as has already been mentioned, is Black History Month, which is an opportunity to raise awareness about black histories and the deep entanglements between Africa, the Caribbean, and Britain. These are the entanglements of empire. But their histories are our histories. British history is the history of empire, of slavery, of conquest, of colonialism, of decolonization, of racial formations and inequalities. So although I welcome Black History Month, I'd also want to say that we need to be thinking about these issues every month. These issues are part and parcel of British history and contemporary British life. The slavery I'm discussing is chattel slavery, the form that was developed in the New World and the Caribbean, and my particular interest is in the Caribbean, where enslaved Africans were taken to work on the sugar plantations and feed the sugar desires of the West. My second context is that I'm a part of a group of researchers and a project in the history department at UCL working on the legacies of British slave ownership. Some of you may have heard Nick Draper, another member of our team, give a lunch hour lecture this time last year on London and slavery. And Ben Reachen, another member of our team, helped me produce our PowerPoint for today. In 1833, when chattel slavery was abolished in the British West Indies, Mauritius and the Cape, and I should remind you that hundreds of thousands remained enslaved in India, they were seen as domestic slaves and therefore not relevant to abolition. 20 million pounds were paid in compensation to the slave owners from British taxpayers' money. This was part of the deal which was done to ensure that abolition would pass through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, where there were many slaving interests represented. So this 20 million was part of a deal along with what was called apprenticeship, which was enforced labor for four to six years, where freed men and women would, quote, learn to be free. They would learn to labor. Of course, they'd been laboring all their lives, but this was part of the deal that was done by the British Parliament. Now, of that 20 million that was paid in compensation, nearly half stayed in Britain. And it was claimed by and paid to British men and women who owned enslaved people. These owners were called absentees because they were not living in the Caribbean, they were living here, though sometimes they traveled to and from, sometimes they lived for a period in the Caribbean, sometimes they were never there. Slave ownership was simply part of the economy in the 1830s. It was a way of producing wealth for some through the labor of others. It was seen as quite ordinary. And on our project, we are tracking the legacies of these men and women who received compensation in 1833-34. This work we're doing contributes to a larger project which is in which many people are involved and many of them are outside academia, which is trying to grasp the significance of the whole slavery business, everything that was associated with it, to the formation of modern Britain. We're wanting to put the history of slavery, of the slave trade and slavery, back into British history, which has kind of evacuated it. The third context is our exhibition in the cloisters, which I hope if you haven't been to see, you will go and see, which is on the slave owners of Bloomsbury. These streets all around here, including Gower Street, were the residences of many slave owners at the time of compensation. This is an unusual way of thinking about the history of Bloomsbury. We tend to focus on the fact that great literary and intellectual figures lived in Bloomsbury. But a lot of slave owners lived here too, in these streets, and we're drawing attention to that part of the history of the area which has not been thought about very much. So please go and see our exhibition. We're reminding all of us how present the legacies of slavery are in the fabric of modern British life. <laughs> 
Part of that work of putting slavery back into British history is to try and get access to the experiences of both the enslaved and the slavers who lived in Britain at that time. And I want to say something briefly today about two women, both of whom voice slavery in different and complicated ways. Mary Prince was an enslaved woman, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning was the daughter of an absentee slave owner, one of the Britons whose fortunes were built on the slavery business. There are particular difficulties in rescuing the experience of the enslaved, since histories tend to be written by the winners and not the losers. There are also even more difficulties in accessing the experiences of women, both slavers and enslaved. In Britain, women were more likely to have difficulties in getting published. They were constrained in all kinds of ways as to what it was permissible to say. There were all kinds of restrictions on what women writers, for example, could do in the early 19th century. While for enslaved women, African culture in the late 18th and early 19th century was an oral culture, and history is a predominantly written form. Where are the sources, the traces of the voices of the enslaved? Toni Morrison, whose great novel, Beloved, reconstructs and represents the experience of slavery in the US, and one of her predecessors is Elizabeth Barrett Browning, calls her historical novels a kind of literary archaeology of the life stories that are missing from the written records. So it's a way of putting together fragments and pieces and trying to reimagine, not get access to the authentic experience, but try and reimagine what those lives were like. And if many of you here haven't read Beloved, I do very, very strongly recommend it. It's an extremely powerful and evocative novel. What I want to point out, though, is that we don't have any unmediated texts. We have to listen for the voices of enslaved women through narratives which were edited or published by others, and they were produced often in order to try and win an argument for abolition. So we can't go direct to the experience of those women in the past, and we have to think about the historical moments in which these texts are produced and the effects that has on what we know. <coughs> One of the traces that is widely available is this medallion produced by Josiah Wedgwood, the potter, for the campaign against the slave trade. Am I not a man and a brother? Am I not a woman and a sister? Here you can see the image of the woman. These images drew on Christian understandings of the universal family of man. All people were children of God. But as many have noted, the assumption behind such an image was of benighted Africans, victims of white rapacity, who needed to be rescued by benevolent Britons. The agents in this history, as it is imagined, are all white. It is white people. Who are, to, who are being appealed to, a white god that is being appealed to. Africans are being acted upon in this image. There is no suggestion here of resistance or revolution or rebellion or active agency. When the campaign against slavery became a significant force in Britain in the 1820s, nearly 20 years after the abolition of the slave trade had been effected through a great public campaign, it was very important for the activists to try and convince the public that slavery was a pernicious institution. This meant countering the propaganda of the pro-slavers, the West India lobby, as they were called, who argued that slavery was a civilizing institution, bringing barbaric Africans into the modern world. It was vital, therefore, for the abolitionists to collect eyewitness accounts to engage in what we might call a war of representation. Who was telling the stories and which stories were true? So they had to engage in a war of propaganda with the pro-slavers as to the truths of plantation life. They relied particularly on the missionaries in the West Indian islands 
who are often at loggerheads with the planters, to provide evidence, and the abolitionists collected all the data they could and published it in magazines and pamphlets. In 1831, Thomas Pringle, the secretary of the Anti-Slavery Society, published The History of Mary Prince, a testimony to the cruelty of slavery and a plea to Britons to work for its abolition. Mary Prince, and we know this, we do know some of these facts, was born in slavery in Bermuda, sold away from her family, worked for a series of masters who subjected her to ill treatment and appallingly hard labor before being sold to John Adams Wood, an Antiguan merchant. Wood had started as a ship's carpenter in Bermuda, became a clerk, started in business as a merchant, and accumulated significant wealth, and therefore was able to buy enslaved men and women himself. Mary Prince worked for the Woods as a washerwoman, nurse, and maid. Mrs. Wood was a very severe mistress, impossible to satisfy, and Mary hoped to be able to save enough money through paid work, which she was able to do when the Woods were absent from home and she was left in charge of the house, to be able to buy her freedom. In 1828, the Woods came to England to place their son in a school and bring their daughters home to the West Indies, and she accompanied them. By this time, Mary had become a Christian, deeply affected by an encounter with Moravian missionaries. It was known that slavery did not exist in the same way in England as it did in the West Indies, and therefore Mary hoped that there would be hopes for her for freedom in this country. But Mrs. Wood insisted that she would treat her no better in the metropole than she had done at home, and she was as good as her word. The wood settled in Lee Street, very close to Gower Street, cheek by jowl with many other West Indians. And according to the history, Mary was crippled with rheumatism, but Mrs. Wood was without compassion, and the woods threatened to throw her out of the house or send her back to Antigua when she protested about the burden of work and her ill health. Mary left the house and sought help from the Anti-Slavery Society, and she eventually entered Thomas Pringle's house as a servant. He was the secretary, as I said, of the Anti-Slavery Society. Pringle asked Mary to tell Susanna Strickland, herself an abolitionist and an author, her story. Strickland would write it down and he would edit it and publish it as an anti-slavery text. Hence, whoops, we've got the wrong uh, slide. Okay, ah, right slide, it's my mistake. Hence, the history of Mary Prince. Now, it's vital to place this narrative, the history of Mary Prince, in its historical context. The aim was to elicit sympathy and support for the abolitionist cause. That was the reason for publishing it. Mary had to be presented as an honest, truthful, respectable Christian woman, one who had been severely mistreated, but who had shown a capacity to remain a hard-working, decent woman, seeking help from good Britons, those not perverted by the system of slavery. Any awkward or disturbing aspects of her life had to be excluded, whether they were questions of rape and sexual abuse by her masters or her own sexual relationships with white men, a totally everyday aspect of colonial life, but one that could shock abolitionists and suggest that she could be accused of immorality. The history was published with a series of texts alongside it, all hoping to demonstrate that Prince's narrative was to be trusted. But its truth, whatever was the truth, was vigorously challenged by pro-slavers, both in print and in the courts. And John Adams Wood sued Pringle for libel and vilified Mary Prince's character, presenting her as immoral and lazy. Mary Prince has been constructed as a black heroine in recent years. Now, let's see what we get. Yeah. A plaque has been placed in her memory on Senate House, the place uh, which is, was once Keppel Place, where she moved when she first moved out of the Woods House. 
and then she moved from there to the Pringles, celebrating her. So she's been represented as a champion of the abolitionist movement, the first black British woman to have escaped from slavery, her life a demonstration of triumphant black female subjectivity, her black identity sustained, however terrible the circumstances of her life. But we need to treat such claims with care. The figure of Mary Prince serves purposes in the present, just as it did in the past. There is no doubt that she lived. There is no doubt that slavery was a deeply inhuman system. But the history only gives us a part of her story. We cannot absolutely access her story. We don't have direct access to her experience. Wood, meanwhile, returned to Antigua and benefit, benefited from compensation, as we know. This is the house that uh, Mary, Pringle, uh, Mary Prince lived with briefly in uh, Lee Street with Wood. And now we can see the compensation record, which shows us, that were, were made for the British government, which shows us how Wood received over 400 pounds for the enslaved people he still owned uh, at the time of emancipation. And at this time, he was recorded as living in Woburn Place, again, very close to us now. So this is to bring this history into our history and into our present. Now, Elizabeth Barrett Browning provides us with another way in, another voicing of slavery. She was the daughter of Edward Barrett Moulton Barrett. Lots of people in the 19th century had very complicated names, which were all to do with their line of descent and property that they'd inherited and the need to take on extra names to show that they'd got property from somebody else. So Edward Barrett Moulton Barrett was the descendant of a long line of Jamaican slave owners who could trace their lineage back to 1655 when Cromwell's troops captured the island from the Spanish. The Barretts established themselves with lands on the north coast of Jamaica and became very significant plantation owners and colonial public men. Edward's grand, uh, Elizabeth's grandfather built up the family fortunes, named his plantations Oxford and Cambridge. This was, again, terribly common. You kind of civilized the plantation, which was a place of horror and cruelty by giving it a civilized English name. And he established sugar works near his great house where the family lived at Cinnamon Hill. There are still many Barretts, black and brown, showing the complicated lines of descent from slavery, living on the north coast of Jamaica in the present. Edward Barrett Moulton Barrett's wife also came from a Jamaican family, the Graham Clarks, who had long connections with slavery. So Elizabeth has slaving ancestors on both sides of her parents. Edward Barrett Moulton Barrett was wealthy enough to live as a country gentleman in England. And as a child, Elizabeth grew up uh, in Hope End, which is this uh, a modern picture of the home they lived in in the early 19th century. This was a greatly beloved family home. Uh, and this contemporary picture of it um, with all the wisteria and so on, does make it clear that it's still the home of a uh, very comfortably uh, wealthy family. From Elizabeth's earliest childhood, she had had contact with Jamaica and was well aware that the family fortunes were de derived from the Jamaican properties and from slavery. Her father and uncle were concerned about the estates in the 1820s, and Uncle Sam, Elizabeth's favourite, settled at Cinnamon Hill. And this is, again, a contemporary photograph of Cinnamon Hill, which is still standing, as you can see, in Jamaica, a delightful residence of wealthy people. In fact, uh, this property was bought by Johnny Cash and modernized by him. So that's what you're seeing here, Johnny Cash's ex-residence. Many, many plantation houses in Jamaica and in the rest of the Caribbean have been turned into hotels um, but many more are private homes. 
so Elizabeth's uncle, Uncle Sam, settled at Cinnamon Hill in order to manage the properties more directly. Three of Elizabeth's brothers went in sequence to assist him on the properties. From the late 1820s, Elizabeth's father was extremely worried about the state of the Jamaican properties and what the effects of abolition would be. He was a paternalistic proprietor, a Whig, a supporter of the 1832 Reform Act, and a Wesleyan Methodist, but none of this interfered with the fact that he was a slave owner. In 1832, when debates over abolition were at their height in Britain, he instructed his attorney to abolish the whip. As a result of financial troubles, the estates at Hope End had to be sold, a devastating blow, and Elizabeth absorbed her father's view that the West Indies would be irreparably ruined as a result of emancipation. Edward Barrett Moulton Barrett, however, received 7,800 pounds in compensation for 397 enslaved men and women who had lived and worked on the Oxford and Cambridge estates. Here we have Elizabeth. Elizabeth Barrett thought of Jamaica as a benighted place peopled by those she described as white savages. Her favorite brother, Bro, hated the time he spent there, and her younger brother, Sam, died there of fever. A recent novel by Laura Fish called Strange Music fictionalizes the events around that. Elizabeth was glad, she told a friend, that slavery had been abolished. But at the same time, she was convinced that compensation for property lost, even if it was property in people, which was immoral, was completely appropriate. Property was property, even if in people. Elizabeth had inherited slavery money from her grandmother, and she also inherited it from her uncle Sam, money which gave her some independence. Despite never having lived in Jamaica, her identification with the island was very powerful. The family had eventually settled in Wimpole Street, again, very close to us here, and a plaque there, as you can see, marks the home of the woman who was to become one of England's most celebrated poets. On the eve of escaping from Wimpole Street, a very exciting tale which is told in fiction again, and is in her letters, uh, and she had to escape because her father was an extremely patriarchal and autocratic man uh, who passionately loved his children, but was deeply possessive of them and had told them, all of them, that if they ever married, he would cut them off without a penny and would never speak to them again. So Elizabeth had to escape in the most dramatic circumstances and elope with her lover, uh, the poet Robert Browning. And interestingly, Robert Browning, his family also had connections over generations with the West Indies. This just gives you some sense of how extremely common these web of connections across Britain and the Caribbean were in the 19th century. So on the eve of escaping from Wimpole Street, she wrote to Robert Browning, musing that the announcement of their marriage in the papers could mention Elizabeth Barrett of Wimpole Street and Cinnamon Hill, Jamaica. So an indication of the power of her identification, a complicated identification with this island where the family fortunes came from. In 1845, Elizabeth was asked by some abolitionists in the United States, where of course slavery had not been abolished, to write an anti-slavery poem for their publication the Liberty Bell. It was already clear by the 1840s, in the eyes of many, that emancipation was far from an unmitigated success. And it may have been easier for Elizabeth to write about slavery in, a, in an American context. It involved a process of what we might call distantiation, distancing herself and Britain from that experience 
Britons were extremely proud of the fact that they had abolished slavery, kept on reminding the rest of the world that they had been the first to abolish it, and looked to others to follow their example. So there's a kind of pride in being the first. They looked reprovingly at Americans who were still backward. Elizabeth wrote The Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point uh, as her contribution to the anti-slavery uh, project. And this poem tells the tragic tale of a fugitive who murdered her child after being raped, impregnated, and flogged. Fleeing north, she arrives at Pilgrim's Point, the point where the Pilgrim Fathers had landed escaping from persecution themselves, a place that they had blessed in the name of liberty and freedom. I am black, I am black, she declares, as she remembers her lover cruelly killed by their master. We were black, we were black. We had no claim to love and bliss. Her black lover had been killed by her master she was violated, and a child, too white, too white for me, was born. Unable to bear to look in the child's face, I covered it up with a kerchief rare to save him from her curse. And he moaned and struggled as well might be, for the white child wanted his liberty. Aha, he wanted his master right. Mother and child could only be reconciled when he was buried by her, only for her to be surrounded by the slave hunters. And she cries, I am not mad, I am black. She curses the men of free America, so-called free America, who tie her and flog her while she calls for rebellion and dies. Lift your hands, O slaves, and end what I begun. In the name of the white child waiting for me, in the death dark where we may kiss and agree, white men, I leave you all curse-free in my broken heart's disdain. Elizabeth was proud of its anti-slavery content and thought it ferocious possibly too ferocious for the Americans to publish. I could not help making it bitter, she told a friend. Perhaps the scale of the bitterness, as Cora Kaplan has suggested, was possible in part because she was writing about slavery in the US, not the British Caribbean. But biographical explanations, looking back to her complicated history, are not enough to account for the militant abolitionist sentiment in the poem. The Liberty Bell, where the poem was published, was closely linked to radical abolitionists and feminists, making it possible, making sense of Barrett Browning's daring portrayal of an enslaved black woman, both sexually and racially oppressed, who calls for rebellion. You know, Mary Prince in 1831 there was no way she could call for rebellion. She calls for good Britons to free her people. You know, that's, that's the most that can be called for. That's the most that can be claimed in the abolitionist context of the 1830s. By the late 1840s, Elizabeth Barrett Browning can make a, make a more uh, dangerous plea for rebellion. This is a figure in her poem who was martyred for her race and articulated that the curse that the white slaveholders brought upon themselves. Yet, like so much of the anti-slavery discourse of white male and female abolitionists, this is an ambivalent work, speaking for the enslaved woman, the adopted eye of the poem, a woman who had no name and who could not speak for herself. Barrett Browning has to speak for her, imagine herself into that place. Elizabeth had her own historic struggle to free herself from the authority of her father, which could only be affected 
through her elopement. He punished her, as he said he would, by never speaking to her again, by never reading her letters, by leaving her none of his money. Her struggle to be an independent, creative woman, which meant rejecting her father, has been justly celebrated as one of the success stories of 19th century white feminists. Yet, in her poem, the rage of the African woman could only be expressed through the despairing act of killing her child and sacrificing herself. Barrett Browning was claiming freedom for the unfree, yet the only freedom that could be imagined was death. She hated slavery, yet she had lived much of her life on the proceeds of the plantations. Haunted by guilt, she knew her dependence on that tainted money. Her favorite uncle had died an untimely death. Her beloved brother was buried at 28. Jamaica was indeed a dangerous place, and cursed we are, she wrote, from generation to generation as slave owners. She wished profoundly that she had some purer lineage than that of the blood of the slave. Both Mary Prince and Elizabeth Barrett Browning's runaway slave without a name voiced slavery, but this could never be a simple act. Prince spoke through a white abolitionist lens. The runaway slave spoke through the daughter of a slave owner. These accounts, complex and mediated as they are, nevertheless help us to have some imaginative grasp of what slavery, an institution that was central to the building of modern Britain, was and how it shaped the lives of both slavers and the enslaved, how the legacies are still with us today in Bloomsbury. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Very powerful talk. We have time for two or three questions from the audience. Would anyone like to pose a question? At the back here. Just hold on a moment. Um, thank you for that talk. That was that was great. Can you hear me? I'm not sort of just a bit closer. Is this better? Um, I was just I was just wondering, really, it was just a thought that the difference between the Mary Price, the tone of voice of the Mary Pro Price writing, and the Barrett Browning one. I mean, the late 19th, late 1840s was a sort of rebe rebellions everywhere. And do you think that influenced Barrett Browning as well? I was thinking about Chartism, who often used um, imagery of slavery and the emancipation of the slaves as part of their discourse. Well, of course, um, you know, slavery was abolished in the, in the British West Indies, um, Mauritius and the Cape, in 1833 partly because of, there's absolutely no doubt, partly because of the Great Rebellion which had taken place in Jamaica in 1831. The slave owners came to recognize that, even they had to recognize that slavery could not be sustained as an institution. And of course, there is also the argument which was first developed by the Trinidadian historian, Eric Williams, who then became uh, the Prime Minister of Trinidad after independence, that. Uh, slavery was no longer an effective economic institution and that free labor was actually more effective. So all those, all those arguments have been going on. Uh, free labor um, has been um, more extensively adopted. And of course, the slave owners in the United States are under pressure because of that. But slavery was still functioning perfectly straight, you know, perfectly ordinarily. Uh, particularly in the south of the United States. So I don't think there was an atmosphere in which uh, it was 
I don't think there was any immediate sense that this institution is not going to survive. And um, indeed, of course, it did survive until the 1860s, and it survived in other parts of the world until later than that. So I think her voice um, in the 1840s comes more from this connection that she has with radical abolitionists in the States who are, of course, putting forward radical arguments about the horrors of slavery, the cruelties of slavery, and hoping, hoping that it is not going to survive as an institution. But we've got to remember that it survived a good 20 years after that. Thank you. Another question over here. It's, it's partly a question, but partly to thank you. It's partly to thank you so much. I remember when there was a celebration of the abolition of slavery. I was on a bus and this woman said to me, isn't it about time all that was put in the past? Having uh, grown up in Trinidad and knowing that the legacy of slavery, because when the slave, slavery was abolished in Trinidad, the slaves were not given the property and indentured labor was brought over from India, and those things are still there and can be seen in the political parties of t 2011 Trinidad and Tobago. So I wanted to say thank you so much for, <coughs> well, it's hard to say thank you because I wish it wasn't, but it is modern, it is here, and I learned a lot. So it's thank you, not a question. Well, thank, thank you for that comment. Um, I mean, the legacies of slavery are apparent all over the Caribbean and all too present in the ways in which race is lived daily in the Caribbean and the way in which labor <laughs> is treated and who owns property and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's also vitally important to say the legacies of slavery are still alive here as well, in Britain. And that the ways in which race was thought about in the 19th century, the way in which African people and Indian people were imagined, that those racial formations are part of what we live with in the present. So slavery, the legacies of slavery, are present in the ways in which we think about other people today. And this is part of the work of decolonization which needs to be done by the colonizers as well as by the colonized. If the colonized have to free themselves, as Marley so wonderfully sang from the legacies of slavery, so too do those who were the perpetrators, those who were the colonizers. And that has not been recognized enough in this society. I think that the way in which the history has been produced in Britain ever since the abolition of the slave trade, is that we're proud of abolition. We're proud of abolition. That's what we'll remember. We can forget slavery, we can forget the slave trade, because we did abolition. And that's just not good enough. It's okay to remember abolition, but we've also got to remember why abolition had to happen, and the ways in which that's framed the modern world in which we live. I think we just, have we got time to just... I'm a, I'm very, very quickly. Two minutes. Could you say a few words about Henry Wilberforce? Was he connected with the Bath Party? No, he wasn't connected. Um, but of course, there are incredible myriad connections between these West Indian families. And what's absolutely astonishing is how connected they are with all sorts of other people. And part of what we're discovering through the work we're doing on the legacies of slave owners is this web of connections which peoples, actually, the British ruling class, actually. I mean, that's where, you know, that's where a lot of it is. And not everybody is wealthy who owns slaves, far from it. Um, there are perfectly ordinary people um, who had inherited, you know, you could inherit um, two enslaved women who worked in Kingston or Bridgetown or somewhere in the Caribbean as part of an annuity, part of a way of leaving some money for an aged aunt who had to be looked after. And some of these women who then claimed for compensation may not even have fully realized what it was that they lived off. 
They lived off the proceeds of slavery, just as many, many, many women lived off the proceeds of the East India Company. And that, of course, was Indian labor. So, you know, colonialism in its many forms and the many forms of unfree labor that were practiced across the empire, as the contribution from here said, you know, indentured labor. There are loads of different kinds of unfree labor. Slavery is a particularly awful kind, but there are many others. And anybody who knows any of the history of the British Empire knows that these forms of, of unfree labor, in, in Britain as well, in Britain as well, let me say, have been practiced. So that's all part of the legacies we're dealing with. And unpicking those legacies is very, very interesting uh, work. I hate to say this, but we have run out of time. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you.